Fish on. Fish on. Fish on. Fish on. Fish on. Oh, that's a good fish. Oh, we got one. Yep. Yep. Get the hooks into him, Mark. Yep. Come on. Somebody. Wow. Get up. <laughs> you don't horse fish, do you? Hang on, hang on. Watch him now. Oh. You got him? Yep. So I have no one but to blame but myself. <laughs> Whoa. Well, you can bring him down here. Why don't you get the tape? I'll get the tape. Smallmouth bass is a member of the Centarchidae, or sunfish family. They tend all to be laterally compressed. They're small to medium-sized fishes with a double dorsal fin, a front spiny rayed portion, and a posterior softer rayed portion of the dorsal. Now, in the smallmouth bass, the mouth never extends beyond the posterior end of the eye. The color of smallmouth bass tends to vary quite considerably from lake or stream uh, to other lakes and streams, ranging in color from uh, a coppery color to this sort of dark green color. In live smallmouth bass, you'll often see very marked bars along the side of the animal, and the amount of contrast between these bars and the background can vary quite considerably. If we had to talk about typical smallmouth bass water, I think we'd be talking about lakes that were larger than 100 acres in size, small to large sized rivers that have a fair amount of, of boulder or uh, riffle area in them with a little bit of current so that the smallmouth would be found in these rivers between the cooler water, faster flowing trout water, and downstream into the warmer, slower moving largemouth bass sort of areas. What's typical of, of all of them is that the waters aren't turbid at all. Turbidity causes problems with silting up of eggs and problems with oxygen requirements for the fish. Smallmouth bass typically spawn from February in the southern part of their range to about late June in the northern part of its range in Ontario. The requirements for that spawning are some rubble area or gravel area in shallow water. The bass start to move in as water temperatures reach 10 degrees centigrade and start to spawn as water temperatures reach about 15 degrees centigrade. The males dig a nest that ranges in size from six inches to a couple of feet in diameter. And within a couple of days of digging the nest, they court a female bass and from one to 5,000 eggs are laid in each nest. The the female then leaves and the male guards the eggs from the period of time that they're fertilized until the young disperse from the nest about four to six weeks later. The young bass then spend the rest of the first summer inshore feeding on plankton and benthos. Late in the fall, as water temperatures again reach 10 degrees centigrade, bass tend to go into torpor and stop feeding. As water temperatures again rise above 10 degrees the following spring, the bass begin to feed once again, and the period of starvation is over. Adults begin to spawn once they reach about two to three years of age for males, or three to four years of age for females. During the, the, the times in which uh, eggs and young bass are on the nest, um, water can be moved by storms and wind into the inshore areas uh, where the nesting is occurring and wipe out all of this spawning within a given year. The other problem that faces young bass is the first initial winter starvation period. To survive during that initial starvation period, they need to be 
of a sufficient size, and the winter has to be a short one if they're going to make it. Fishing is often dominated by one or two very good year classes, very good, strong, large groups of bass passing through a fish. The original native range of the smallmouth bass extended from northern Georgia, westward through northern Tennessee into eastern Oklahoma, as far north as the Sioux, through North Bay, into southern parts of Quebec, and down the St. Lawrence. Smallmouth bass were so highly prized that they've been introduced now widely across North America and northward into rivers that began to flow into the Hudson Bay drainage, into South Africa, into Central and Southern America, into the Far East. Smallmouth bass eat a tremendous range of things, so we might find crayfish, um, minnows, leeches, large tadpoles, large insects, larval insects of various types, and everything ranging down to small bass. In stunted populations where the maximum size reached by adults is much smaller, you typically find large insects, such as dragonfly nymphs or uh, other th large in larval insects, uh, as the major portion of the diet. Bass tend to move offshore and onshore at various times of the day, so that during the day they're found offshore in deeper water, but late in the evening or early in the morning, they move onshore to feed on crayfish and minnows along the shores of lakes. Because it's this time of the day, during the, the morning and evening, that the crayfish are active. <laughs> Smallmouth bass are another of those confused cool water species that seem to be able to thrive in very many diverse conditions and body of water types. You're, you're uh, right, Glenn. If we were fishing uh, something that we might think of as a lake trout lake, we might pull up our downriggers or pull in our wire line after lake trout fishing, move to some shallow bays, and throw crankbaits and catch uh, smallmouth. And we could also go on a middle-aged, more warm, fertile-type lake and be jigging a jig and minnow along a weed line for walleyes and start catching some nice smallmouth there as well. That's true. I do a lot of my smallmouth fishing in very eutrophic-type water, stuff that we would generally associate with uh, largemouths. And quite often, I'll be uh, throwing a spinnerbait into weed pockets, primarily looking for largemouths, and pick up a real big smallmouth. We can't forget current river situations. They're probably some of the most underfished smallmouth waters, and rivers can produce some big, easy-to-catch fish. A fish in a river is a fish in a river, and whether it's a smallmouth bass or a rainbow trout or a walleye, there's one key location factor, current breaks. If you can find that current break in conjunction with broken rock, that's a big key for me in rivers. Some other things that you have to know about smallmouth bass is because they are that homebody, generally those areas where they spawn and have that broken rock that will hold crayfish also have to be adjacent to some deeper water for the cold water periods of the year. They're not going to make long migrations, so they'll make that short vertical migration from shallow to deep water under severe weather conditions. The one place that I start with in lakes is finding that crayfish holding habitat and as you mentioned, broken rock. I think that what we're looking for is rock about fist size. Boulders can be absolutely super for smallmouth bass as long as they're on a bottom that consists of broken fist-sized rock because that's good prey fish holding cover. And the boulders then offer shade and an ambush point for a smallie to hide behind. In lakes, uh, reed beds are, are very good for smallmouths, but they've got to be in conjunction with that broken rock too, or the best ones are. Um, also, uh, wood. I think it's important to mention that when I'm looking uh, for a real big smallmouth, the one thing else that I'd like to add to that broken rock shelf and deep water is some a little bit of weed growth. Some weeds nearby, because when you start looking for smallies in excess of four pounds, then they have to have a bigger forage than crayfish all the time, and that weed growth will tend to hold perch and other minnows. I catch some uh, very large smallmouths out of areas that don't have broken rock, and what I look for then is extremely thick weed growth. 
because that will also hold crayfish. I guess what I'm saying is that there are exceptions to every rule. In river situations, bottom transition can be important because in those rivers, finding current breaks aren't a problem. Every weed is a current break. That bottom transition may also mean that you've found the one area of hard bottom that's a good spawning bed. But that bottom transition becomes extremely important if there are just so many current breaks that it's hard to choose which one to fish. Once I've picked out a number of areas that I want to fish, uh, I'll go to specific baits. Uh, and I use some baits as locational baits, baits that I can quit fish an area quickly with and eliminate any water that's not producing. Once I've made fish contact, got a couple of smallmouth bass, then I'll change to a bait that I think is a higher percentage presentation. One of my favorite type of uh, smallmouth locational baits are these free swimming plugs. This is a racket shed, this is a spot, and these baits have rattles inside them. They're really noisy, just like a child's rattle. Right. They have to be fished fairly quickly. They don't float, so you count down the depth that they run to, fish them quickly, and they put a lot of sound in the water. They'd be excellent along the edges of the weeds in your dark colored rivers in, yeah. your, in your more eutrophic bodies yeah, and of water. In those dark colored water, sound is really important. It's a lot more important than color. In uh, a lot of bodies of water, uh, this, this bait here, this silver color has a lot of flash. It's very attractive to smallmouth, but the main color preference, as far as I'm concerned, by smallmouth bass is something in the crayfish pattern. And by crayfish in baits, I think it's best represented by lots of browns and oranges. Another vocational tool is, of course, the standard crankbait. Once again, we've got crayfish colors. This is a particularly good river fishing tool when the fish are extremely active. These baits do float, but the larger the lip, the deeper it dives, and with this bait, you have to make contact. You can cast it downstream, you can cast it across the current, and uh, because of the current, I can just let this bait sit in the current, and it'll just work against the current uh, in front of that fish. Sounds very effective during the colder water periods of the year when the fish may be not quite so aggressive or turned on to that faster presentation. Another bait that I use a lot when I'm fishing for smallmouth and a lot of people overlook are largemouth bass type spinner baits. These very weedless, very snagless spinner baits are absolutely super locational baits for smallmouth bass. We certainly can't go uh, smallmouth fishing without jigs. And that's the number, I think we both agree that that's the number one bait. I use these baits as locational tools. This is a weedless jig. I can fish along the edge of one of those weed rock transitions. Mm -hmm. A little brown bucktail, just a little belly of orange. Uh, I, I've had tremendous success with this particular jig. Now this, this little jig up here with the rubber legs, I always add a little strip of pork to this. And again, it's simply to slow the fall down. Light lines, four to six pound test is not uncommon, uh, especially in rock areas. You might have to go to eight pound test if you're fishing weeds. We've uh, looked at a variety of, of tackle here and uh, I think it's probably time that we uh, figured out what we're gonna hang these things off the end of. Well, there's two basic types of rods that I like to use for smallmouth fishing, and I think they're pretty much standard. This is a bait casting rod. Uh, it has a uh, high-speed retrieve. I usually use lines from 8 to 12-pound test maximum. For smallmouth, I try and stay with as light a line as possible. I'd say 10 is a good average on, on your bait casting rods when you're dealing with smallmouth. I would agree. I go to uh, 12 uh, if really dirty water l allows me to, or if really thick weed growth or really thick timber forces me to. I like a rod that's got a fairly medium stiff action, I would think. I like a rod that I can feel the bait working as it's coming through the water. And now I'm using graphite and not for the power to move the fish, but for the sensitivity. So for throwing baits like the crank baits or the free swimming baits or the spinner baits, a bait casting rod is the way to go. And then when I've located the fish that I want to catch, I'll change to a spinning rod, a standard open face spinning rod. Uh, this rod again 
is any rod that's suitable for fishing a line from four to eight pound test. My personal preference is for a rod that's a little bit on the shorter side, five foot six, five foot eight, five foot nine. It's gotta have a little bit of backbone. So for jig fishing, I like a standard open face spinning reel and a nice medium action graphite fishing The rod. only uh, place where I would uh, differ uh, with your rod choice is in very strong current rivers and you simply need a slightly longer spinning rod to have more control over that bait when you're drifting it and I would probably go to uh, maybe as high as a seven foot rod for fishing jigs and strong currents so I can I can present that jig in a very natural manner keep lots of line out of the water and keep in contact with that jig. We've looked at a really wide variety of terminal tackle here that all works for small mouths uh, why don't we pick up some rods and go out and see how some of this hardware looks in the tank? This sounds good to me. Okay. The low swampy shoreline of a eutrophic lake or the granite cliffs surrounding an oligotrophic body of water offer the first clues as to the nature of what lies beneath the surface. To further identify features in the underwater environment, and to fine-tune an angling approach, the depth sounder and the hydrographic chart are invaluable tools. Navigational charts show depths usually marked in feet. Contour maps use continuous lines which make structures such as drop-offs, shoals, points, and holes easier to visualize. The skill of converting these flat representations into a profile of actual features improves with repeated practice. Aerial photographs, if available, used in combination with maps and charts, can aid the conversion to reality. Note the dredged channel and the visible tops of shoals. Canoes are an excellent way to fish uh, inaccessible water, basically because they're portable. And starting at the back here, we have polypropylene rope, and this is easily accessible if we need it. This piece of equipment I'm familiar with, it's a portable flasher. The transducer just clips on the side. This does come in handy in, in, in larger, deeper water, no question. You know what these are. <laughs> Personal flotation devices. I wouldn't go in a canoe without one. We've got a jury-rigged live well, and it just looks like an ordinary cooler. But if we open it up, we've just got a little uh, aerator pump here mm -hmm. and a couple of clips that go on our battery and we can use this battery to run our uh, flasher unit as well or electric motor if you don't like paddling that, that's right <laughs> and it's great for keeping bait alive and we know that live bait works well for small oh, yeah, that's a good idea um so let's move over to this conventional boat here and this is something i'm more familiar with <laughs> The most important thing to me in this boat is this tiller drive motor. A really effective way to present a lure to river fish is by slipping. And to slip, it's sort of a modified back troll. We put the motor in reverse with the boat facing downstream and run it at approximately the same speed as the current. We can simply present the bait vertically under the boat the same way as you would back trolling. I would say you'd have to have eight or ten feet of water or more. Exactly. With less depth, we're into an electric trolling motor situation if the current's moderate. If a river has a fair number of motor boats using it, uh, the fish really aren't all that spooked by the motor. You're not going to get them fishing vertically under the boat. They'll move, but they won't move that far. So what I like to do is to put the motor in reverse, head upstream at a very slow spot, I'd stand at the back of the boat, use my knees to control the direction of the boat, and as we know, we present jigs upstream. I could present j dra jigs to visible structure that I saw upstream to the sides of the boat. You could be in the front, which is now the back, mm -hmm. and present a crankbait downstream. And we could fish a whole section of, of, of river that way. You're making the most of your fishing opportunity, and you're, you're covering a lot of water. appreciate it. <laughs> I thought you'd like those words of wisdom. <laughs> Lots of time. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is the fun part of getting it's a the line. good fish. Yeah, it is. Excellent fish. All right, now I got you. Mm -hmm. 
I'll get out of the current. Come on. Wow! Oh! Lovely fish. Hey, I'm impressed. Another bait that I like to use as a locational tool is a bait that most people think of as a largemouth bass bait, and that's a spinner bait. And I like to use a single spin in, in clear water. My first choice in colors is white, but uh, in dingier water, chartreuse or brown and orange, and larger blades in dingy water because they put a lot of vibration and sound. Right. Again, I'll cast it out. I'll let it hit the water and let it flutter down a little ways. When it gets to the depth I want to fish, I'll start my retrieve. I don't jig it. I just swim it back very slowly. Just keep a nice, even, steady retrieve on the bait. What about uh, live bait? Do you, um... Yes, I, I really like to use a jig and live bait combo, and it's, it's my next choice. If I'm fishing uh, a weed line where there's fairly heavy weed growth, I'll use a leech. But uh, later in the year, uh, or early in the spring, uh, as soon as the season opens, you can't beat a jig and minnow combo. Once that water turns colder and minnows are the primary feed, uh, some sort of minnow presentation is just dynamite in all situations, rivers, lakes, uh, big water, small water. This particular minnow here is uh, a little bit on the small side. In the fall, I'd go to a much larger minnow, a three or four inch. Sort of like a uh, fly fisherman matching the hatch. Exactly. You've yeah. got to go with what the fish are feeding on. I like a real simple retrieve. You, I don't jig it a whole lot, especially in, in the early season, because the fish just aren't going to get turned on. Their metabolism's down because the water temperature's down. We've talked about a very important tool for any smallmouth fisherman being a jig. And this is my favorite jig right now. It's a flat, floppy-tailed stingray grub. I like this jig because it's very versatile. You can swim it. You can bounce it on the bottom. As long as you keep in contact with that bait and hit bottom once in a while, it's following the contours of that water exactly. And that's very important in rivers because those fish are going to be tight to those current breaks. We fish this bait any way but downstream. And the most important thing, I think, for fishermen to remember about fishing jigs is that they keep in contact with that jig. We might be fishing a rock bluff or if we're fishing timber, we want to get the jig in there. We've got to have some way to get the jig to fall straight. So we'll throw the bait out, just put our hand on the reel, keep contact with the jig. When you run out of room, rip, rip it up, put your finger on, keep contact with the jig again. And in doing that, you can keep contact with the jig all the way down. If you want it to fall three feet or 43 feet, uh, you've always got contact with that jig. Now, I've got one more presentation, and I don't think you can beat live bait for smallmouths, especially in cold water. I agree with you completely. One of the things that's hardest to fish in rivers is a crayfish. They tend to tumble. They tend to crawl in underneath oh, rocks and get stuck. So what I've got here is absolutely classic steelhead float tackle. And you just flip it upstream. You don't even have to keep contact with the bait. You just let the float drift down. And when the float goes down, you set the hook, and you've got a smallmouth. It seems a very interesting way you have that crayfish hooked on there. It's very important to use a long shanked hook with crayfish, because if you don't, you're not going to get a good hook set. And I'm using a very thin, razor sharp wire hook because this is a long, very soft rod, and trying to set a hook into the bony mouth of a big smallie is really difficult. I just simply put a rubber band around the crayfish's tail and slide the hook under it. Uh, it improves the power of my hook set, and it also makes the bait look really live and natural. There's no way I can kill a crayfish. Fish on. Big fish. Good. <laughs> really big fish. <laughs> Good. Nice. Small yeah, enough. way over there. <laughs> Walk that way. OK. That's 
a respectable fit. Very, very nice. Very nice, Mark. Was he running three pounds? Uh, a little over three. I'd say he's yeah. almost 20 inches. Good. Very nice fish. Good. Finally got an adult. <laughs> yes. It's lovely. That olive green, weedy smallmouth. Here we go. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Thanks, Mark. Come on, sweetheart. There he goes. Oh, looks like a good smallmouth. <laughs> Look at him fight. Whoops, I'm sorry. Good little fish. Oh, he's hooked well. He wasn't going to get away. That's a yes. chunky little fish. Yes. Not a huge one, but he sure is pretty, isn't he? Pound for pound out here. They're a good fight. Boy, he is pretty, though. Fish on. Sorry to have them under control here. All right. Goodness gracious. Got in there, Marcus? Yep. Thanks very much. Let me get the hooks into them first. Okay. And one in there. Whoop, there he oh, goes! Look at that. All right. All right. Okay. Yes, All right. very nice fish. No rush. Yeah, this dude. Oh, here he goes. Oh, no. <laughs> Sideways in the current. <laughs> in the southern uh, part of the range, the opening of bass season tends to occur well after spawning is over. But as you move north in the range, the beginning of season tends to bring problems for spawning bass. Much of the fishing in a season occurs in the two-week period after opening begins. Bass fishermen are often removing spawning males, and what happens is the loss of all of their progeny. All right. There's been a tendency to increase fishing pressure during that period with things like fish derbies and so on. And in, in setting up fish derbies, we must consider the effects on, on spawning bass and perhaps look at ways to protect them from this heavy pressure. Fish On was supported by a grant from Canadian Tire Corporation Limited and its associate dealers.